Once again, we want to really appreciate you for joining us in today's online service. This is Harvester's online service. And let me tell you something, anywhere you're watching from, either you're watching within the country, within the states, or anywhere in the globe, you are welcome. You are welcome to a time of deep spiritual experience, encountering the Word of God, and your life will not be the same again. If you have some time, please sit down, give us your moment and attention, because God is going to change your life in a radical way. My name is Bola Jido, and I'm the pastor of Harvesters, and for the last 15 years, I've had the privilege of helping people know God, helping them achieve their dreams, and challenging them to become pace setters. And either it's your marriage you want to work on, either you're a single person, and you want to work about a relationship, this, this, this is what we do to help people become all that God has designed for them as a business person, as a career person, the word of God will come to you, challenge you, change you, transform you, and make you that person you ought to be. At this moment, if you are here for the first time, you're watching online for the first time, maybe you're watching from within the country, within the state, outside, it doesn't matter at all. When you send us an email, we would love to connect with you. We have global church members that watch from everywhere else, and we just connect to, and we can connect with you also. Send us an email. I'll be willing to email you back and send you a gift in your mailbox. At this time, this is what we normally do. We normally worship the Lord with our, our substance. Proverbs 11.25 says something very powerful. And the Bible says this. It says, The liberal soul, the general soul shall be made fat, and he that watereth shall also be watered. This is a very difficult season for most people all over the world. But guess what? We are able to give unto God because he gave to us. We are able to give to God shows our sign of faith. And as we give our tithes today, give our offering today, I want to notice something. The Bible says the liberal soul shall be made fat. You know, one of the, um, I, I got a testimony that I'm coming to service today about a certain person that had a job difficulty. And this person is known to me and it talks about how he's always giving and tithing and just always going on. And he said, Pastor, you not believe it. In three days, I was able to make one million euros, one million million euros for the organization. That's really powerful. That's really powerful. Do you know what I'm saying? This? Some of you are going through a very tough time right now. And I want to encourage you, even if you have nothing to give, God can come through for you. And all of you that tighten and giving the offerings, let's believe the Lord that this will not be the last for you. That's going to increase. And it's going to multiply in Jesus' mighty name. The details are on your screen. If you want to do a bank transfer, please go ahead and do that. If you're watching from outside the country, you can give on the website using your debit or credit card. I'm going to pray at this moment. Let's go ahead and pray. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for the privilege to even give. Father, this is a very tough time for people. A lot do not have. A lot are struggling. That we can have to give. That you've opened our heart to give to you. We give you praise and glory. And as we give to you today, out of a liberal heart, Lord, we pray you receive it in Jesus' mighty name. And I'm asking that doors would open for people. Thank you for the lady that sent the testimony of our loan was cancelled. We give you praise and glory for this. God, there will be more testimonies of financial growth in Jesus' mighty name. We pray. Amen. Amen and amen. Amen and amen. Thank you very much, Pastor Maiwa. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Glory to God. That's Pastor Maiwa from, from the Kedja campus. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Are you ready for God's word today? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. This Today, I will be talking to you about developing superior discernment. Developing superior discernment. Will you please turn your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 5? Hebrews chapter 5. Developing superior discernment. Hebrews chapter 5. And something you, you, you might want to know is this. That sometimes the most difficult choices are between good and better. That's the truth. Sometimes the most difficult choices in this world, you know, when it's good, between good and bad, everybody knows what bad is and nobody would really choose bad. But when it's between good and better, it's actually sometimes extremely difficult. And that's why you need discernment. You know, um, you know um, I remember a story. It, this person used to be my neighbor. And it happened in Nigeria in the, in the 80s. And what had happened was this. This man had applied for a loan from the bank because he had some contract to execute. And just imagine, I'm not sure of the figures again. Maybe it was something worth 100 million naira. I know it might be different where you're watching from. 100 million naira. And, you know, he asked for this loan. And, I mean, he got the contract. And as soon as the loan was paid into his bank, for some reason, two days after, the person that gave him the contract canceled the contract. And he had taken the loan from the bank. He had the loan, and there was no, there was no more contract. Just imagine this amount of money was 100 million naira. And he wondered, 
What am I going to do with it? And, you know, sometimes decisions are not that simple. It's, it's not as simple as good or bad. It's not as simple as this or that. It's just complicated. And he, he said, for some reason, he said, I, I believe that God laid me. He said, for some reason, when that contract was canceled and I was stuck with the loan I'd taken, because if I pay it back, I'm going to pay charges. Just the charges was huge already. He said, I have the loan already. You know what he did? He took the money and converted the money to dollars. He took the money, converted the money into dollars. And he ended up with, you know, several, several hundreds, probably millions of dollars. When he, like, he took the money at that time. And guess what? That weekend, the government made a devaluation of currency unprecedented. That was about 500% unprecedented. And they devalued the Naira by about 500%. And you will not believe it. By Monday... <laughs> he needed 20% of that money to pay back to the bank. And he had about 80% left to himself. And, and the reason I'm saying so is that sometimes when it comes to decision making, and when you hear stories of very successful entrepreneurs, you know, I was, reading, I was reading the story of eBay. And how did eBay start? Because sometimes when you hear stories of business people, some of you think that, you know, everybody had it worked out from the beginning. They're very strategic. Why some people started that way? That's not how a lot of people started. A lot of people just started because they were able to discern. They were able to, you know, sense what God was doing. They were able to sense not just what, I mean, in the business world, they will not say that way. They were just able to observe trends that others could not see. So eBay, how did eBay start? You know, and the pierce the way. What he did was that he had some old items and he was sending them on, 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 a, on, on a site. And before you knew it, other people were contacting him and saying that, you know what, I also have old items I want to sell. Will you be able to sell this on your site? And he had to upgrade a site at some point and he began to chat them and the whole thing metamorphosed into eBay. And the thing is, is when you talk to successful entrepreneurs, when you talk to successful career people, there is a time in their career, in their entrepreneurship journey, where they have to make a certain dramatic shift and such shift is based on two decision which is one is always good and the other one is always better which means any way they choose they win but the ones that make the leap are the ones that for some reason they're able to see within themselves that the better decision is actually ahead of the good decision and the reason I'm saying so is that what they used to see that way is discernment it's the sermon. The sermon is very, very powerful. You know, I love the way the Bible says that the Bible says Abraham entertained angels on the way. Did Abraham know that those people he entertained were angels? He did not know. How did he, but why did he entertain them? He entertained them because of what discernment. He just was able to discern at the moment. The sermon is very, very powerful. The same thing, you know. I, 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 I have a friend that runs a huge oil and gas company, and this is one of the biggest in, in my country. And he was saying, and th th there's an official in government that is very helpful to a lot of that transaction. And I was like, oh my God, did you have to buy him? Did you have to buy him? And he said, it will surprise you that we didn't have to really buy him. He said, when it was nobody, when he was not in government, in not in active politics, he said, for some reason, I just felt something good about him. I just maintained some kind of relationship with him. And you know what? When he moved into politics, just because of the strength of our relationship, when nobody knew him, he had come to trust, to love, and to honor me. And he just felt it was a season just to kind of pay me back. But the question is this, for that entrepreneur, why was he making those sacrifices when nobody saw the future in this noble man? Because of discernment. Because of discernment. What is discernment? Discernment is outstanding judgment and understanding. It's most of the time discernment is not based on fact. Most of the time discernment is not even based on something you can see. Discernment, what is discernment? Discernment is knowing which door to go through and which door to pass by. That's what the sermon is. The sermon is knowing which door to go through and which door to pass by. Because <clears throat> not all doors are opportunities. Some of them are traps. That's what the sermon is. The sermon is the ability to judge the quality to comprehend the unseen. Just the ability to judge the quality to comprehend. And why am I saying this? Because I believe that one of the things that becoming a fully devoted follower of Christ will do for you is that he will help you have spiritual discernment. Why, this, why all these people in businesses have really, you know, what some people call executive intelligence or they will call some kind of executive discernment. 
I'm talking about you have very spiritual discernment. This is very powerful because when you have discernment, listen to me, you will not make certain mistakes. Without people really talking too much, you are able to judge character of people and say, I think this is a wonderful person and that's a, this is a wonderful person. How do you know that? Just because you can discern. Just because you can discern. The sermon is powerful. Listen, when you know how to discern, you will find out something. You will start building relationship today that you need for tomorrow. And you don't even know the reason why you are building it. All for you to get to tomorrow and be like, my God, I'm thankful. I was able to make that decision yesterday and build that relationship yesterday. Because of the sermon, this is the word of Jesus of the Bible. The Bible says, and Jesus Christ will commit himself to no man because he knew he was able to discern everybody's heart. The sermon is powerful. The sermon, would, the sermon will help you override and overcome political influence. The sermon will position you for opportunities. And as disciples, because we are still teaching on our subject of discipleship, one of the things that true Bible discipleship does is this. The same when the physical, the sermon helps people make strategic decisions. He positions them in a better way. In the spiritual, when you have the sermon, you become, you become a better and a stronger disciple. That's what the sermon, do, the sermon does. So the question is this. Okay, the sermon is powerful. Hey, Jesus had the sermon. Peter had the sermon. You know, one time, one time, I came across someone, it was after service, the person felt really excited and all of those kind of things. But, you know, I just really believe in my heart that this person was not what it painted it to be. And guess what happened? Sooner or later, the whole story blew up and I saw the person for who the person was. But I was grateful for discernment. Why am I saying this to you, Hebrews chapter 5? Let's see what the Bible says. This is very powerful. Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 10. The Bible says, called of God different to Jesus Christ, and high priest after the order of Melchizedek, of whom we have many things to say and had to be altered, um, altered rather, seeing that you are dull of hearing. So he was speaking here about Melchizedek. There are many teachings that say Melchizedek was Jesus Christ that came in the flesh. Listen to me. It, Melchizedek is not Jesus Christ. The reason why it was this, John 1 says the word became flesh. That means that until the physical manifestation of Jesus Christ at the best in Galilee, there was no physical existence in flesh. That's what it means. The Bible says this. this the Bible says this. <laughs> the Bible says this. Just very powerful. Some of the Holy Spirit. See, Melchizedek is just a, it's a, it's a typology of Christ. He says, verse 12, for, verse 11 says, Of whom we have many things to say and had to be altered, seeing that you are dull of hearing. Verse 12, for when you ought to be teachers, did you notice that? He says, when you've learned something that God expected to move from learning to teaching. Listen to me. Many people do not realize that the way to actually become a better student is to teach what you learn. He says this. He says that you need to be taught again the first principles of the oracles of Christ and have become such I have need of milk and not of strong meat. Verse 13 says this. Not everyone that useth milk, sorry, for everyone that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness and is a babe. He calls this person a babe, the person that uses milk. Look at the next description, verse 14. But strong meat, that, that, that's like spiritual food. He says strong meat belongs to them who are of full age. Even to those who by the reason of use. So how do people grow spiritually? When people go spiritually, they begin to feed on deeper spiritual diet. Listen to me. There are some things. Some of you are feeding on spiritual SMA. Some of you are feeding on spiritual cellular. God is saying you have to go deeper. There are deeper dimensions in the spirit. There are deeper levels in the spirit. He said for these people, he says that they could just use milk. And because they could use milk, they are babes. Look at the next verse. He said, but strong meat belongs to them who are of full age. Even those, listen to me, not only do they have strong meat, he says, even those who by the reason of use. Listen to me, it's not just about knowing strong word. He says there's something about use. Who by the reason of use have their senses 
exercise, to discern between good and evil. Many people always ask this question, how am I going to grow spiritually? Listen to me, spiritual, spirituality, or spiritual, um, spirituality or spiritual growth is going to take you using what you know. It has to do with the law of use. That's what it is. I will tell you something. The first time I, I walked in the gift of prophecy, you know, I was nervous, I was shaking, I was terrified. But, and the reason was that it's my first time. But you know what I noticed? As I began to grow and develop, what happened eventually? The more I used the gift, the better I became at it. What am I saying to you? The way spirituality works is this. The more you give yourself to it, the more you use those things, the better you become at it. How do you know how to pray? By praying some more. How do you know how to fast? By fasting some more. How do you know the Bible? By studying some more. It's not going to jump on you. And listen, when you start, when you start, sometimes your increment or your increase is very, it's very minimal or not significant. But the more you keep at it, what happens to it is that you'll be seeing a lot of incremental growth. So what I want to show you is this, that the people that have grown spiritually, they have the ability, this is what verse 14 says, to discern. They have the ability to discern. Why am I saying this to you? Because discipleship breeds discernment. That's what I'm saying. Discipleship breeds discernment. Discipleship breeds spiritual discernment. The goal of the Christian life, every Christian is this, to be like Christ. And that's why when we talk about spiritual maturity, some of you are listening and you're watching and you've been born again for 20, 30, 40 years. And you're wondering, what is there to do right now? The thing is this, I know you've done this for quite a while, but there's still a lot of way to cover. Because spiritual maturity is not about how long you've been born again, it's about how much you've conformed to the image of Christ. The goal of every Christian is to be like Christ. That's very clear in Romans chapter 8 verse 29. We were designed to conform to his image. Ephesians 4 says we should be, the, we should be equipped to the full image, to the perfecting of the saints. We are meant to be growing every day. That's what God's dream for us is. The sec, you know, and, and the, second, the second thing is, is, it is the use of our spiritual senses that promotes the development of discernment. Let me explain what that means to you. When you talk to people that know money, that, that work with money, one of the ways they train them is this. They expose them to so much original notes and sneaking, you know, some kind of fake notes. And when they touch that note, because they've been so exposed to the right note, they can pick that note and say, this note is wrong. Hallelujah. There is a level of exposure to light that darkness can be perceived from a mile away. Hallelujah. There is a level of exposure you will have to light that darkness, evil intention, can be perceived from a mile away. The Bible says in Acts chapter 16, the Bible tells of a story of, a man, of, of, of Paul. Paul was walking by and a young girl, pretty nice, cute girl, you know, you, you say harmless girl, only that the girl was demon possessed. Nobody knows she was demon possessed because she was beautiful, had nice blonde, you know, she was like uh, the Instagram slim queen. I mean, looking very nice. Probably her name was Shine there. And you know, and, and, you know she was just there and when she saw Paul passing by, she even said the right thing. He said, these are the men of God. They've come through the ways of salvation. I mean, how... That was so perfect. But every time she said that, but because Paul was a disciple that had spiritual discernment, let me tell you something. Paul looked at her and he could tell straight that though she was pretty, though she was saying the right thing, that what she was saying, the origin of that thing was of the devil. And Paul took authority and said, you demon, come out. You know what I'm saying? So the sermon is so powerful because some people have the right actions. They say the right thing. They do the right thing but their heart is really polluted even when you think they're benevolent that benevolence is coming from a place of evil but when you have discernment you are able to see more than what the eyes can see you are able to know more than what the head can know you are seeing and hearing by the power within your spirits and that's why I said there is a level of exposure that you have that you can to light that you can sense darkness a mile away Glory to God. Huh. If all you see is all you used to judge, you are very limited. 
And this is what discipleship does. Because the more you become a disciple, what happens to you? The more you become a disciple, the more your discernment is groomed. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 5, the Bible says they are able to discern what is good and evil. Have you seen people that are saying, well, should I marry? Should I not marry? They cannot discern accurately. If you're asking those questions, maybe the reason is that you've not been able to, to just use your spiritual senses. And let me say this quickly here. When it comes to hearing God, let me, I'm, I'm going to slow down this. When it comes to hearing God, if you are new into it, you don't know what it works, please, I ask, I beg of you, make sure that the decisions you want to hear God about, or you say God spoke to you, are not decisions that are life-changing. You can't claim you have never heard God as a pattern and the very time you heard God, it told you who to marry. That is so confusing. If you make a mistake, that's something you cannot recover from. You can't claim you've never heard God before. The first time you want to hear God is about relocation. That is, that is a huge decision. You need to practice in small things. Small things like when you practice, if it doesn't happen, it's a mistake, it's okay. And that's why you see a lot of people do crazy things in the name of Jesus because they really think they heard God. Meanwhile, they're speaking to themselves. They're under some kind of mind or demonic influence. And they really think it's God. And they really think it's God. Glory to God. So, so today we're still talking about discipleship. Someone said, why don't you become a disciple? Because there's a reason why. The more discipled I am, the more I can have stronger discernment. I enter into a business decision. I, I, I see all the papers there. And all the papers look right, but I feel a pullback. Because I'm a man of the Spirit. I don't just make decisions by data. I make decisions by the Spirit of God. You know, there's this lady I met in church. I even met her in church. She sings in the choir. When she sings, she sings like an angel. But, and I feel like, oh my God, this is the bone of my bone, the flesh of my... I feel excited. And before you know it, I just feel a pullback. And the reason why that there's superior discernment in me glory to God just just very powerful so the more you are disciple the more your discernment grows so let's begin to look at this so how do I grow spiritually or how is my discipleship journey so when I talk about discipleship I'm talking about spiritual growth the first thing is this spiritual growth has to be intentional these are just facts of spiritual growth spiritual growth has to be intentional Spiritual growth is not automatic because you got born again. Spiritual growth has to be intentional. How do I know? The Bible says grow in grace. He says grow in grace and in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Almost meaning that you have to take responsibility for growth. The people that don't grow spiritually are those that for some reason just assume that because I'm a Christian, if God wants me to grow, I will grow. If that is what it is, when you give birth to a baby, put the baby in the box and say, if God wants him to grow, he will grow. Listen to me, for you to grow, you must be intentional about it. Nobody grows. He says in 1 Peter 2, 2, as newborn babes, desire the sincere make of the word of God that you may grow thereby. The second thing about spiritual growth is this. Spiritual growth is incremental and not instantaneous. How, what do I mean? People really think that if I'm going to grow, I will just explode. Boom. No, sir. The way it is is that God begins to build gradually into you. God begins to build because all of us are work in progress. Sometimes God is taking away the loss. Sometimes God is taking away the bitterness. God is taking away the unforgiveness. God is working in you to think more like him. Spiritual growth is incremental. It's not like that huge thing that happened. And that's why Philippians 1.6 says that I'm confident of this very thing. That he that's begun the work in me will finish it. It's a journey. It's a journey. And let me say something to you. How does God grow us? Huh. How does God grow us? Very powerful. One, God grows us by word. And that's how I want to say something to you quickly. If you're serious about spiritual growth, you'll pay attention to Bible reading. You'll pay attention to going to our website, our YouTube page, and read. Because one of the ways God grows us is by his word. First Peter 2 says that. The second thing that God used to grow us is people. Ephesians 4 helps us to understand that, that God has given us apostles, prophets, teachers, evangelists, and pastors for the uh, keeping of the saints. Some people think they can grow by themselves. No, sir. That's an illusion. God uses this. Listen to this. 
It takes disciples to raise disciples. Nobody is discipled alone. For you to be discipled, you need to be raised by a disciple. That's why you have to find a small group to go to and find other people that God has touched and changed their life so that they can change their life also. You know the reason why? Some things are read, some things are caught. Hallelujah. Some things are read, some things are caught. There are meetings where I can, listen, I know the person that taught me how to pray. His name is, first name is Peter. Oh my God, Peter. I could pray. I knew when that prayer fire transferred to me. My God, that guy was burning and shining. I'm saying so to you because some of you want some fires. Some of you want some mantles. And the fire you want and the mantle you want, Sonos is carrying right now. And all you have to get it is to get close to them and catch that fire because spiritual fire is contagious. Hallelujah. If they burn with it, it can rub off on you. If they have it, it can shake up on you. The Bible says about Saul, when Saul came into the midst of the prophet. They said, and Saul began to prophesy. He said, it's Saul amongst the prophet. Any fire you want to see, look for people that carry the fire. Look for people that carry the mantle. Stay with them. Convert it. Desire it. Value it. And let the fire come upon you. See, if you're a family and you want your husband or wife to be spiritual, you want family to be spiritual, and you don't have family friends that are really spiritual, you can do that. You will never have it. The reason why is that whatever you value, you attract. The reason you don't have such people in your life is this. You don't even value them in the first place. You must begin to make decisions to have such people in your life. And one of the things that God used to grow us is this. God uses pain to grow us. Adversity. You know why? When things are tough, for most people, not all people, for most people, it makes them humble, it makes them quiet, and makes them open towards God. So some people, when things is going, business is coming in, they made $2 million last month, and career is going in, marriage is fine, this is good, this is good. Life is so fast, they have no attention. And some of you, I'm not saying that God causes the trouble. But when the trouble comes, God uses the trouble to get your attention. And all of a sudden, you know, all of a sudden, when you get into trouble, maybe you get into a marital trouble, maybe you get into a financial trouble, maybe you get into a, a money crisis, maybe you get into a health trouble, maybe you're sick with COVID. All of a sudden, when that happens, God did not cause the trouble, but in the midst of it, God is hoping that he can use the trouble to reach you. And that's why I love to say this way, that what the enemy taught for evil, God turned around because the enemy wanted to attack me, but God used the tragedy that Satan taught to mess me up, to draw me closer. And some of you, the, what God wants from you right now is this. Very simple thing. Pay attention to me. Because tragedy and pain, sometimes we call it travail. Travail. Travail has a way of making you humble. Ah. All of a sudden, <laughs> some people say, Pastor, I don't know how to fast. You don't know how to fast because you have not had a problem that will make you fast. You think you don't know how to pray long. You don't know how to pray long because you have not had some that will pray long. I always tell people, pray so that you don't have to pray. Because there are two kinds of prayer. There's voluntary prayer and there's prayer that you have to pray because of circumstances of life. But the question is that when you go through this traveling, so, 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 so lady, m maybe you're really single right now. And you're wondering, I'm 37 years old and you know, as... <laughs> The Lord is speaking to someone right now. There's a lady watching, just a single lady. I wonder, I'm just tired. And God is saying, can't you see that even Satan is trying to mess you up? I actually am trying to reach you. And some of you that are going through business crisis, all of those things that was meant to destroy you, God is saying that, will you pay me attention right now? Because I got the whole world in my hands and I can bring about solution. But instead of you to do that, you are working so hard. Instead of you to back up into God. Because sometimes... The biggest thing is that God uses adversity to get our attention. This is where David says it. David said, when my heart is overwhelmed, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. When my heart is overwhelmed, when I have troubles that money cannot fix, when I have challenges that I don't know how to sort out, when I have troubles that 
It seems all over. When my heart is overwhelmed, blood pressure is rising, bills are rising, there is no money, I'm sick and tired, everything's black, there seems to be no future. When my heart is overwhelmed, he said, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. And God is using that problem to call you to a higher place today. If you're listening to me today, and you are going through some challenges, and I'm pointing my finger right at you through that medium you're using to watch, it's because God is saying to you right now, you, and you're saying you, you, exactly you, and saying, I'm using all of this to bring you to a higher place. Glory to God. I say glory to God. First Corinthians chapter 9. Spiritual growth, verse 27. Oh, wow. God is calling people today. Many of you, you know why you're not growing spiritually? Because everything is okay. Because success can be very distractive. Success is loud. And you don't need to get, you don't, you don't need problems to get you to God. You can just pay attention to him today. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 9. See what, David, um, what Paul said. Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, in verse 24, he says, Know ye not that they which run in the race run all, but one receives the prize? He says, Run that you may obtain. He says, Every man that strives for mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do this to obtain a corruptible crown, but we, an incorruptible crown. He said, Therefore so run. Not as uncertain, so fight I, not as one that beat the air. He says, I take my body and I bring it. He says, this is, when he says my body, he doesn't mean this body. He means the natural human desire. If you want to grow spiritually, there's something that will get in your way. It's called, what is it called? The, what is going to get in your way is the natural human desire. Human, the natural sinful desire, it gets in your way. And Paul says, this is what I do. I take my body and I begin to blow it. I go into a boxing match and I give it an uppercut and I give it a lower jar and I put it in the round in, in the box 18 and I'm and I'm boxing it. He said, I subdue it. Listen to me. Until you learn to deal with your spiritual, your natural appetite, you will not grow spiritually. Until you learn how to fix all those ambitions. You know why? When Satan knows that there's something that you put close to God, that competes with his attention, even if it's career, even if it's marriage, even if it's husband. You know what Stan does? Every time you want to get serious with God, he's going to tap that thing. You know why? Once it taps that thing, you lose focus. And that's why God said, thou shalt have no other God beside me. God says, I, I, I don't want any rival. Hey, but but, but this, is what they, this is what Paul said. He says, I keep my body and bring it into subjection. The reason I'm saying so is this. So, so, so let's read that. Let's read the, maybe the last scripture, Luke chapter 9. Oh, glory to God. Aha. Uh -huh. Luke 9. Mm -hmm. Glory to God. Ah. Verse 23. And he said to them, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself. I spoke, I spoke about that last week. I spoke about, let him come after me. I spoke about that three weeks ago. I spoke about um, um, denying himself last week. This week, he said, take up his cross. Take it up where? Daily. Why? Growth. Any kind of growth is going to cost you something. Why? You have to give up to go up. You have to give up to go up. You have to give up to go up. Listen, you are carrying too many things to go up. For you to go up spiritually, you have to give up some things. Some things cannot allow you to go further. So you must strip yourself. Growth will require sacrifice. What is sacrifice? The first thing is you. See, many people want to please themselves. And growth is going to require you saying no to you. That's 
what growth is going to require. You say no to you. Sometimes there's a challenge and you need to fast and pray. But as you fast till 10 a.m., you look at the kitchen. You can smell the aroma of the food. And your stomach says, hey, hey, go and eat. Be careful. That was how Esau ate his destiny. Some of you, the blessings you have lost because you couldn't control your mouth. The Bible says in the New Testament that nobody should become a profane person as Esau. Some of you, it's the food. It's sleep. You go through a whole day, no Bible study, because you woke up late, you sleep late. Why didn't you join the early morning prayer meeting? Oh, I, I was sleeping. Paul says that I want to sleep, but I bring my body and I put it under, I, I'm like, put under subjection. I'm put under subjection. Listen, everyone loves to sleep, but sleep can destroy destiny. The Bible says this way. It says, a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands, so shall poverty come upon you. Are you here? Some of you, it's not food, it's not sleep. It's friendship. You know what the Bible says? He said friendship. Some of you, the, the strongest influence on your life are people that advise you out of God's word. And the Bible says friendship with the world is enemy within God. And every time you hang out with those people, because you care so much about them, they keep pulling you away. Every time, every time you go out with them, you know how you come back. You come back heartbroken. Every time you pray, you wish you didn't go out with them again. Some of you, it's not that. It's ambition. It's just the dream you have for your life. It's just the fact that someone told me, say, I need to make money at any cost. Listen to me. I would love to make money, but I cannot tell anyone anywhere. I would love to make money at any cost because some costs are too high. I will not give up my soul to make money. Some people even marry a man, not because of love. They'll marry because of money. And Jesus Christ said, if you want to follow me, come after me tonight. He said, you must carry your cross. You must carry, listen, other people, other fucking, listen, as a Christian, if you can do everything your other friends that are not Christians are doing, I have the right to tell you we have to test your Christianity because your Christianity is not Bible Christianity. Your Christianity lacks evidence of Christianity. If I'm a Christian, the way I spend my money is different. The way I talk is different. I'm not even able to use the F word. I'm not even able to do that because I'm a Christian. There are places I don't go to. Some people just sleep on the couch on Sunday. I'm a Christian. Sunday is for God. Monday is for God. Tuesday is for God. When I wake up, I pray. Hallelujah. I believe in the Holy Ghost. I'm not shy. I cannot be shy of God. Some people get into a place and they become shy of Jesus. I'm not shy of God. I'm tongue talking. When it's time to pray, I can lift up my voice towards heaven. I can pray in the spirit. That's what it is. If you, you may not like me, that's who I am. That's who I am. It's a carry my cross. If you think I'm uneducated, I'm not touched, I'm not civilized, I'm, I don't belong to the elite group, I understand you. But when I get to heaven, I will look back and say, you that belong to the elite group, where are you? The problem is this. The modern day Christian, we are not willing to embrace sacrifice as part of Christianity. When you read books, Read books of people. Read books. Read of the apostles. James the apostle was beheaded for Christ. He never denied him. Some of the prophets, Jeremiah, was cut into two for God. He never denied him. The challenges you are going through, are they that deep that you want to deny God? How come daily prayer is difficult for you? What will it cost you? You can read all sorts of blogs and spend hours on Instagram, but 10 minutes of Bible study you'll find so boring. Are you sure you have found Jesus? What is wrong with you? You can save money to buy um, wedding clothes. You can save money for that person's um, um, batch eve. You can save money to travel to Spain to attend the wedding. When it comes to giving your tithe and giving your offering, you always say, I don't have, it's not enough, it's not enough, it's, it's what they want. What is wrong with you? Don't you realize that God even gave you everything? This is 2020. Have you taken time to win a soul for Christ? 
The reason why is this, when we get to heaven, all that will matter will not be if you're a banker, a doctor, will not be if there was COVID-19 or COVID-20, all that will not matter. All that will matter is that in 2020, what it did for Jesus. I'm saying it today because the biggest thing the decision we have to make is to embrace sacrifice. And let me tell you something. Ask yourself this question. When was the last time I sacrificed? This generation of Christians have a mentality. It has to be easy for me to do it. If it's easy for you to do it, where is the God you're talking about? Even in the African traditional religion, you will see them tie white wrapper, go out at midnight, carry sacrifice to a God that cannot talk just because they believe in that Amadiora or in that whatever it is. What about we that we serve the living God? Can't we make some sacrifices for him? Why must Christianity be easy? The disciple doesn't think that way. The disciple does not think that way. The Bible says something. He said the disciple is not above his master. If Jesus suffered, if Jesus had pain, we are going to suffer. We are going to have some pain. We are going to make some sacrifices. I said, why, why don't you let the smart girl? I, I'm shy. My brother, it's not about you. <laughs> don't make yourself so important in the equation. Why are you not prayerful? You know, I'm not giving to prayer. You can learn it. This is sacrifice. Just remember, your spiritual growth is going to take sacrifice. What did he say? He says, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself. Take up his cross daily. You must take it what? Daily. What do you do daily? Daily. Daily. What are some habits? You carry your prayer daily. Even though I don't feel like praying, when I wake up from the bed, oh, God, love I, I turn into Instagram at 6.30 a.m. Because I'm, that's what I'm doing. I look at the Bible, I don't read, I don't even understand, but I do it. Every time I'm giving, it's daily. Every time I'm serving, it's daily. Someone offend me, I feel like beating them up and showing, cussing them out in traffic. I remember, I'm a child of God. I wouldn't do that, I walk in love. That's what it means to be a Christian. I want to ask you, you know we have Bible programs in our church, HSDC we call them. Have you signed up for one? Someone say, I don't have time. If you don't have time here, will you have time when you get to heaven? You don't have time for that, but you have time for TV series? You have time to be reading all the things you read? The major thing that you are not yet prioritizing the things of God. Are you still thinking about yourself? Or it's time to think about God? Let's pray. Hallelujah. Let's pray. Remember, growth requires sacrifice hallelujah if it's not hurting you are not growing i said i said if it is not hurting you are not growing it's time to leave this paralyzed lukewarm lethargic christian life and come up tina and come for the fire brand holy spirit field full of energy the bible calls a spiritual vibrancy and vibrancy that's what the lord wants not the kind of christianity that is just dead when they say as now yeah man you yo money hey when they say jesus i'm i'm, I'm a man i'm not very expressive <sighs> see what money can do to you you're not expressive for your Lord and Savior. He's not your Lord. Jesus is either Lord of all or is Lord of none of it. Make up your mind today. Let's pray. And Father, let the fire fall. Let it consume the flesh and ambition and lethargy in Jesus' name. And today, if you're not born again, I want to lead an auto call. Say with me. Are you back stealing? Say with me. Lord Jesus, I heard the message again today. You touched me. I believe the message that you died for me. You were raised from the dead for my justification. I receive you into my life in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. If you pray that salvation prayer, it as a new person or you want to be restored, send me an email today. 
I want to include you in my prayer list of those I pray for regularly that give their heart to Christ. Let the fire of the Spirit of God be your life. Join me tomorrow morning, 6.30 a.m. for a time of prayer. Amen.